Sean Hook's Newsmaker Saturday starts now. This week on Newsmaker Saturday, we're going to hear from the two candidates vying for Maricopa County Attorney. Very important job. We're going to hear from Democrat Julie Gunnigal in the second half of the program. But we'll begin with the current county attorney, Rachel Mitchell, who was appointed to the position by the Maricopa County Board of Supervisors after Alistair Adele resigned in March. Now, Ms. Mitchell has been a top prosecutor in the county attorney's office for 30 years, much of it focusing on sex crimes and crimes against children. She was also chosen by Republicans to question Dr. Christine Blasey Ford and Brett Kavanaugh during Kavanaugh's Supreme Court confirmation hearings. Joining us now, Rachel Mitchell. County Attorney, Maricopa County, good to see you. Good to see you. Thank you for having me on. We don't have a lot of time, but we'll get right to it. Okay. Um, what do you see as the chief role of the prosecutor? Chief role of the prosecutor is to make sure that the community is safe uh, while handling cases and doing justice, uh, doing justice for both the victim and the accused. So what would be the top goals for you in this position? One of the top goals is to work better with the police force. Um, there had been some strained relationships under my predecessor, and it is a critical partnership. That doesn't mean we don't hold each other accountable, but they are the investigative branch, if you will, and we are the prosecution branch. And so we have to very clearly communicate expectations and needs to each other. Um, so working together with them, part of that involves putting together a protocol on how to handle demonstration cases so that those are not uh, dropped. And uh, That's where the tension? Uh, there was tension. I think there was just a lack of communication from the previous county attorney in law enforcement. Abortion has somehow animated this mm -hmm. job with, with what happened with Roe v. Wade over the mm -hmm. summer. Um, you made clear a, a week ago that you would not prosecute women who mm -hmm. seek an abortion. Mm -hmm. But you left out of that what you would do with providers or, or medical people. Mm -hmm. Could they be prosecuted? Would you prosecute them? Yeah, um, I mean, first of all, the law doesn't allow the prosecution of, of women, and I've certainly, because of my history as a sex crimes prosecutor, would never re-victimize victims of rape, incest, or molest. In terms of what the law is that's controlling right now, as you know, John, it's up in the air, mm -hmm. and it's uh, before a Pima County Superior Court judge to decide which of two valid laws actually actually applies here. And until that happens, I'm not going to move forward on any cases. Now, I don't have any in front of me, um, but until that law is clarified as to what is in control, I can't even really move, take that first step. So you would follow the law, whatever it ends up being? I would follow the law, and I would also... Do you have prosecutorial discretion on whether you would pursue it? Absolutely. I think any case that comes in the door, I use discretion on every day of my life, and that is to review the case and say, is this worth prosecuting? Is it worth prosecutorial resources? Is it, uh, does it have a reasonable likelihood of conviction? And of course you have to take into account community attitudes because you have to get a unanimous jury. Okay, in Maricopa County, um, the ACLU was diving into this, that mm -hmm. blacks are statistically more likely to be charged with crimes, mm -hmm. even in Maricopa County. Population here is 6%, ACLU says 18% of blacks are charged with crimes. What does this speak to? What's going on? Well, you know, I mean, this is a phenomenon that we've seen throughout the country. And actually, there was even a uh, California DA's office that did a research on this by taking out any indicia of race in a certain category of cases, like robbery. And what they actually found was the prosecutions of people of color actually went up. So I think we have to look somewhere else besides saying that this is just, you know, a product of bias. I think a big thing that we're looking at is socioeconomic factors in terms that of... it's an economic issue more than a race issue. I think that's absolutely correct. Okay. Um, we keep hearing that prisons are overflowing with low-level drug offenders. Is that true? No, not in the sense that people are going in because they're a first-time possessor of drugs. We can't even get prison under the law for those types of cases. What you may be seeing is cases where people have repeated drug offenses and are committing drug-motivated crimes, such as stealing cars or catalytic converters, something like that. So there's a motivation there that's related to drugs, but it's not solely 
just possessing drugs. And it might be trafficking, which is a very serious offense, even though it's not a violent offense necessarily. Absolutely. We're seeing people who have never been involved in the criminal justice system before getting large amounts of money to traffic huge amounts of fentanyl over the border. And those people have to be held accountable. Two in five pills contain a lethal dose. And these people are transporting essentially death to the citizens of the United States and Maricopa County. Um, you recently moved to require prison time in mm -hmm. plea offers made to people accused of using a gun while committing a felony. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that. Well, in one p short period of August 19th to August 29th of this year, we saw 16 homicides in Maricopa County. 15 of those were gun related. And, uh, you know, having been in the office for 30 years and I saw a similar kind of trend back in uh, the Rick Romley era, um, he implemented a similar policy and it was effective. So we went back to a similar policy, but I added on people who are felons in possession of weapons right. um, to include a prison time for those and the serious drug or serious gun. Because the felons who possess sometimes could get a plea deal that required no jail time for that. Absolutely. So you're, you're trying to close that circle. Yes. Um, you mentioned Rick Romley. If people are watching right now, you've been at this for 30 years in the Maricopa County Attorney's Office. Mm -hmm. If there were one prosecutor, Maricopa County Attorney, mm -hmm. that you would say, okay, you want to know what I'm going to be like? Mm -hmm. It's X. Mm -hmm. Who have you worked for that you would say you most reflect their sensibilities? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, obviously, I, I kind of grew up as a prosecutor under Rick Romley. Uh, I also worked for Bill Montgomery. I, I find both men to be very honorable. I never felt like any sort of um, anything unethical was asked of me. Uh, I frankly never felt that under Alistair Adele, but obviously she had severe personal problems. So I admire that about both men, but I'm my own person, and I... Uh, probably would do plea policies a little bit more like Rick Romley in the sense that it's more of a weighing and a balancing as opposed to a um, hard and fast policy or at least as Bill Maybe called them more guidelines. Maybe ideologically driven? Um, actually more individually driven and looking at the individual and the circumstances involved in the case, not just the crime, but the, the history of the person, um, the motivating forces, those types of things. Uh, the, the former, you recently, we talked about the prison time on plea office for people uh, using a gun while committing a felony. Mm -hmm. Former prisons director Charles Ryan pointed a gun at officers during a standoff. He was later arrested, as mm -hmm. you know. Was he given preferential treatment? I think he was charged with a class six, which could mean jail time. But mm -hmm. some people said he could have been charged with a class two, mm -hmm. which would have been 10 years potentially in prison. Mm -hmm. Did Charles Ryan, was he not treated the same as another person in that circumstance? Absolutely. He was not given preferential treatment. Uh, that was a case that was actually reviewed under the prior county attorney. And I was a division chief and made the recommendation of the class six after reviewing all of the body worn camera, after reading the police report, um, after talking to police involved in the situation. And so because that decision was not made under my predecessor and it had to be made under me, I, I kept my recommendation and which by the way was a unanimous recommendation of senior management. Yeah. Um, prosecutor, uh, you were handpicked by uh, Republicans to question Mm -hmm. uh, not only Brett Kavanaugh's Supreme Court nominee, but Christine Blasey Ford, mm -hmm. his accuser. How much does that come up on the campaign trail? I'm curious. It comes up every now and then, um, typically more out of a, a curious questions like right. how did you get chosen, that type of thing. Do you know how you were chosen? Um, not exactly. I was, uh, they called up Bill Montgomery and they asked to interview me and uh, I know that they had interviewed other people who had proposed a much a, a harsh treatment of Dr. Ford. Um, there's no way I would have proceeded that way. I pr proposed more of a, a forensic interview style, which is what we would do with anybody making these allegations. And that's what they wanted and I'm what, who they chose. What did you learn from that experience? Because you, that is high wire stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it was uh, like drinking from a fire hose, as you can imagine, to learn all of the things that went into that. But the bottom line is my job was to do what my job is to do a lot of times in dealing with uh, people who are coming forward with those allegations, and that is to let them talk. And um, 
they they monitored the number of questions that I asked her and how much time she spoke as opposed to the other side and she spoke three times as long and got asked three times as many questions and so that's success. Did you find her in the end not credible? I found her to have some issues that affected her credibility. Ultimately, it's up to the senators to decide whether that was enough for them. What is your opinion of prosecuting distributors of fentanyl? Uh, Pima County, as you know, just the last few days, they are going after somebody for murder charges because they distributed fentanyl to someone who later died. Mm -hmm. Is that your position? Well, we'd have to look at the situation, obviously, if how we can directly link the fentanyl provided to the person. I know there's uh, legislation that's been proposed in front of the legislature for the last couple of years that has not made it through. I think there's going to be another attempt. So I would wait to see how that goes. But obviously, when somebody is distributing fentanyl, we do have significant sentences that we can go after and I absolutely favor doing that. This is a, you know, I met a woman on the campaign trail whose son died from a fentanyl overdose mm -hmm. and I mean it stuck with me, her comment, she's like, I still can't see in color. I mean she's so distraught over the, the grief and the, because a lot of times parents don't know and it's so sudden, yeah. it's just tragic. Do you think on balance legalizing marijuana was a good thing? You know, I have to say no, and I know that the majority of Arizonans voted for that, and I respect, you know, the voters will, and I will abide by it, but we have seen an increase in felony DUIs uh, that are basic, based on marijuana use. We've also seen a fair number of people, because this is not a regulated industry, because it is... This is not the marijuana that was of 30 years ago, mm -hmm. and it's so genetically modified. We're seeing people who do not have criminal histories going into a psychotic break on the, using marijuana and committing some pretty horrible crimes. Final thing, this is a pretty stark choice between you and your opponent, and we'll hear from Julie Gunnigal in a minute. Mm -hmm. What would you like to illustrate to folks watching how you differ from her? Okay. How would you like to quantify it? I don't think that this, this decision could be any more stark. Um, I am a career prosecutor. I believe in supporting the police. I believe bail should be given to people who, um, to, who have committed very serious offenses. Uh, I believe in mandatory sentences. I believe in holding people accountable and enforcing the law. I would not set, like, for example, a minimum um, under which I wouldn't prosecute for theft. Uh, because I believe in enforcing the law and holding people accountable because my number one job is to keep the community safe. Her, her focus is more on social reform. Rachel Mitchell, great to see you. Really appreciate it. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Julie Gunnigal is coming up next on Newsmaker Saturday. We're back in a minute. Back on Newsmaker Saturday with the Democratic candidate for Maricopa County Attorney, Julie Gunnigal. She is an assistant state attorney, was in Cook County, Illinois, where she prosecuted financial crime and public corruption, a former law professor and community activist. And she ran for county attorney in 2020 and lost to Republican Alistair Adele by two points. Julie Gunnigal joins us now on Newsmaker Saturday. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Okay, the first thing on your website mm -hmm. is abortion. That's right. Tell me why, where you stand on it, what is your position, and how would that how would that color your role as attorney, as county attorney? Sure. So the role of the county attorney is to get up every day, make Maricopa County safer, and only to pursue those cases that are in the interest of justice. So one of the things that I was asked exceptionally early in the race, like I think before we got those 4,300 signatures in 21 hours, is if Roe were to fall, would you prosecute under this 1864 abortion law? And my answer is the same then as it is now. Not now, not ever. This is not how we use the criminal legal system to invade people's bodies and bedrooms. Okay, so if it becomes the 15-week law, mm -hmm. which even Paul Bender, who was on this program, you know him, constitutional lawyer over at um, ASU, he said he thinks the 20, the 15-week ban will be the, the law of Arizona. Sure. I mean, you run into the same sort of access to justice issues. You end up tying doctors' hands and people are left to wonder whether or not they're going to be able to receive care. 
And what that actually looks like in the case of the 15-week ban is that doctors are left wondering, under this good faith exception, how close their patients need to be to death before they can access a life-saving abortion. So in that case, what would, if that were the law of Arizona, how would you handle it? No, I want to assure doctors and nurses we're not going to use the criminal legal system in this way. Okay. Um, you have said that your opponent in the Maricopa County Attorney's Office continues to overcharge or over-prosecute people. What do you mean by that? That's right. And it's not just me saying that. That is literally every single major study that has come out of our county has said that Arizona has become the fifth largest incarcerator in the country and the eighth largest in the world. We spend $1.5 billion every year we're in our We're a big prisons. county, though. I mean, we're, I think we're the third largest, second largest county in the oh, country. Oh, sure, but that's, those are per capita numbers. Okay, so that's how out of step we are with the rest of the country and the world. What, what is happening? What do you think is driving this? Well, I don't think we ended up on this system by accident. Um, there are a select few who are getting rich off of this system, whether it be our privatized prison beds or the privatized prison services that happen. Putting people in prison has become a big business in Arizona. And what we hear day in and day out is that results in disproportionate sentences against um, typically uh, people who have been convicted sometimes of these lower level crimes, sometimes it's issues related to racial disparities in policing and prosecution. But one of the things that we can do if we wanted to be forward looking, save taxpayer money and keep our community safer is double and triple down into treating mental health issues and addiction as the public health crises they are. And that means treatment over incarceration. So you would prefer a model where you're diverting offenders into treatment rather than behind bars. That's the long and short of it. Yeah, when it's appropriate, people who are addicted should be in treatment. There's a number that struck me. I want to ask you about it. Mm. it it's a study out of Sweden. You may or may not be familiar with it. This really hit me. It said that the finding was that 1% of the population commits 63% of the crimes. Have you seen that? That's out of Sweden, and they, they believe that this is something that actually applies to the developed world, that we, that would apply to us. So you've got a small group of bad actors. Should that 1% be dealt with harshly and put in jail for the sake of the community and the safety of the people who pay your salary, pay the, pay the taxes, Oh, think? sure. And if that were happening right now, if that's the long and short of the criminal legal system story in Maricopa, I, I likely wouldn't be running and would be doing something else with so my time. So you think we're overstepping that number? We are far overstepping that number. And uh, the, the numbers out of our prison show it. Listen, 97% of everyone who's in an Arizona prison right now will one day get out. But the fact of the matter remains that access to rehabilitation and addiction treatment services and mental health services are just so woefully inadequate inside Isn't our prisons. Is that a state issue or is it a county attorney issue? We should all be caring about what happens in our prison because it ends up being a public health issue for everyone here okay. if 97% of everyone who's in prison gets out and they don't have access to, to treatment. Your critics have claimed that you want to defund the police and let people out of jail or not charge them in the first place. Is that true or false? That is completely false, and I do not know how many times I can say it, but... <laughs> well, you can't say I'm throwing you something you haven't heard before. No, and at the end of the day, the county attorney doesn't have, you know, the role in producing a police budget, doesn't approve of the police budget, has never produced a police budget. You know, what I've always stood for, it, and this is, this is how the current Maricopa County attorney is, is attacking me, so I did say loud and proud that we need mental health treatment in our in our county and so in our city. So that's what, you, what you're speaking to is when you were supporting the 25 Saves Phoenix Lives. Absolutely, group. which was a forward-looking budget bonus proposal that would have gone toward mental health first responders. Would it have stripped money away from the PD to, no, department? No, it would I mean, not the, have. the allegation is that it would have stripped $25 million out. It was forward-looking, and it was money that was uh, being considered for other programming. Redirecting money? From a forward-looking budget proposal that results in, what is it, less than 2% of the overall Phoenix municipal budget. You would like to see more mental health professionals out on the streets as opposed to cops? Is that fair to say? I would like to see more mental health treatment generally. We do know that we have a huge access to service problem in, in Arizona that collectively makes us all less safe. And that's particularly true when we're talking about the proportion of Arizonans who are currently experiencing homelessness. Yeah. And they deserve treatment, access to treatment as well. Um, some of the things you've talked about, mm. and this is going to be your critics are going are gonna to ask this, that you've talked about have been tried in Philly, San Francisco, Baltimore, Chicago, L.A. 
These are cities where crime rates are soaring. People are afraid, they're worried, they don't like what they're seeing. Can you assure the voters that you're not trying to take Phoenix down that road? Sure. Um, so first, the proposals that I'm putting forward, which each and every one are based on the best evidence that we have, things that will actually reduce harm in the community and save us money, um, are supported by conservatives and left-leaning folks alike. The only people who aren't uh, supportive of them are the people who are getting rich off our current largely privatized prison system. But to just talk geography, the programs that I'm proposing in particular that take us down to being just the center of the nation, average for once when it comes to incarceration, are none of those places and none of those cities. It's the state of Utah. Those are the proposals that we're talking about. Okay. You've also talked about protecting voter rights. That's right. Do you believe voter rights are not being protected in Arizona right now? We will see how this next election plays out. Um, specifically, we are concerned about voter intimidation at the polls and what that looks like. So I think we need Have to... Have we had a big problem with this? Uh, we need to be proactive about making sure there isn't a big problem because one of the, the issues surrounding uh, voter, voter rights and mm -hmm. voter safety is that once the polls are closed, the issue is largely, is largely done with. Um, and that means that the results of the election get certified and they are free and fair. We need to make sure that there's no intimidation going into those booths. You've talked about um, disparity in sentencing and even up front on your end of charging. Mm. Systemic racism in the county's legal system. You've talked about this. I want to throw one at you and I want to get your reaction. The U.S. Justice Department, their Bureau of Justice Statistics looked at this between whites and blacks. Mm -hmm. They found, the Justice Department found, there were no statistically significant differences by race between offenders identified and persons arrested. White and black people were arrested proportionate to their involvement in serious non-fatal violent crime. That is rape, robbery, ag assault. Mm -hmm. Are they right? Potentially, but that's not the whole story here in, in Maricopa County. So in Maricopa County, 19,000 people will go to bed tonight in an Arizona prison whose convictions originated out of Maricopa County. 19,000. 19,000. Of those 19,000, you see about 20% uh, of those folks are black versus about 4.5% in Maricopa County's uh, population. That means that black folks are overrepresented by four times in our presence. Are they having more interactions with police? Well, there's a couple of different underlying causes. Um, but when we talk, again, about treating the root cause of harm in our community um, and dismantling the school to prison pipeline, this is what we're talking about. You know, the, the disparate racial impacts of our criminal legal system start at the absolute earliest age, whether it be for people who are black, indigenous, people of color. And it is still true um, and has been replicated in study after study that, for example, Latino folks in our community face fines, fees, and court costs that are eight, I'm sorry, they're $600 higher than their white counterparts. That's interesting you mentioned that because that same Justice Department report found mm -hmm. that Latinos were charged more. So they, they, they did, they nuanced it because they said sometimes uh, victims can't identify whether they're Latino, white, they're not sure. Mm -hmm. So that, that is an interesting point. Do you support the death penalty? Uh, in Arizona, I think we have big death penalty um, issues, and I think we need to address those issues head on. Specifically, we do see racial bias in the death penalty. We do see issues. Would you charge it? Whereas I, I you know, we need, to, we need to take a tough look at each and every one of those cases. That's a maybe. Um, it's, you know, it's just really difficult to say at the outset, and, and I don't think any prosecutor should be saying at the outset and committing to it. Um, you've talked about helping veterans, creating a veterans treatment court. That caught my eye. I haven't heard anybody talk about that. We don't talk about this enough. Maricopa County is home to the second highest concentration of vets in the entire country. And we have such a pervasive issue with veterans being locked up that we have not one but two prison yards devoted to vets. We have municipal veterans treatment courts that work, they're wraparound services. We need to take them to the felony level because right now to have access to those treatment options, you need to plead guilty to an offense This first. is a priority for you. 100%. Julie Gunnigal, thank you. My pleasure appreciate to be here. It. Really, really appreciate your time. Julie Gunnigal, Democratic candidate for Maricopa County Attorney. We're back in a minute on Newsmaker Saturday. Thank you. Mm -hmm.